Gorbachev takes cautious steps to dismantle the roadblocks to reform, while Boris Yeltsin, Moscow party leader, grows impatient and breaks ranks. Once friend to the Communist Party, Yeltsin would soon tear apart the official line of perestroika. His actions were not without their consequences during the Second Russian Revolution. You're our hope, our only hope. You're our strength, our faith, our bright future. Please understand this and show us the way to the future. You're embarrassing me. No, no, we believe in you. Boris Yeltsin, relaxing in the late autumn of 1990 at a government health farm, is the Soviet Union's most popular politician. But no one would ever have heard of Yeltsin had it not been for Perestroika and Mikhail Gorbachev. I just recently met with Gorbachev. There was so much to talk about. So much has built up between us in the last five years. In the first five years of the Second Russian Revolution, Yeltsin has been both partner and opponent to Gorbachev. While Gorbachev has played a subtle game, nudging the Soviet Union towards democracy, Yeltsin has hit a lot of political aces and some notable double faults. Mikhail Gorbachev opened the autumn 1986 political season, not in Moscow, but with a visit to the south. Gorbachev's host, Ivan Poliskov, was both a power in the Communist Party Central Committee in Moscow and the boss of his region. I was convinced, and I told Gorbachev, that if he forced these multi-candidate elections on us, nothing good would come of it. The local party bosses were happy with the elections they'd always run. One candidate, one seat, no problem. I'd already had problems when I tried multi-candidate elections. My party workers complained sending me notes saying, quit fooling around. We know this is just a formality. We know who the choice is. So don't waste our time. The next day, at Poloskov's own party headquarters, Gorbachev gave his side of the argument. Why perestroika could work only if the party took a full dose of democracy. If the Soviet people see that the Central Committee and the government are just taking baby steps, well, then, comrades, we will face the consequences from the people. He was talking to us. We were the regional party bosses from the towns and collective farms. Our understanding of perestroika was different. Time has shown that there are quite a few people who understand all too well what perestroika is. They know what perestroika will do to them, so they reject it. Well, we know these people. We can see them now. They shout about perestroika from every rooftop. But they're putting the brakes on perestroika. The people see this and will deal with them sooner or later. Gorbachev planned to use the power of the people to take the brakes off perestroika. But first, the party would have to agree. Democratic elections would be the death knell for the unchecked power of the party bosses. Their security within the fortress was under threat. 
the showdown would come at the next meeting of the party's central committee. On January 27, 1987, its 300 members were to gather behind closed doors in the Kremlin to approve or reject Gorbachev's proposals for elections to party posts. The night before the meeting, I received the proposals and studied them. It was my first look at them, and I studied them all night. And I didn't like what I read. These high-ranking officials would no longer be appointed. They would have to be elected. So it was quite possible that they would lose their jobs. It was like stirring up a hornet's nest, creating all sorts of alarm and confusion. These were the first open attacks on Gorbachev. In the face of conservative resistance, Gorbachev backed down. He stopped trying to push elections through the Central Committee. But he wasn't done with democracy yet. It was after this January meeting that the real battle for perestroika began, a battle that still continues and isn't over by a long shot. Within months, the battle lines had been firmly drawn. Not only conservatives, but radicals, too, were up in arms over perestroika. They saw little change to the old ways. By the time the Politburo gathered on Lenin's tomb for the 1987 May Day celebrations, they were deeply divided. The first to break ranks was Boris Yeltsin. He picked up the flag of democracy and waved it provocatively in the party's face. Standing there on Lenin's tomb? Yes, that was acceptable. But I believed in real ties with the people. I believe that's imperative and vital for any politician. The traditional party men said the party must remain on top. They were led by Yegor Ligachev, Gorbachev's right-hand man, then at the height of his power. Those were great days for me. I felt wonderful going to work every morning. My heart sang. Everything was looking up for me, for the party, and society. This conflict between the party man and the populist would come to dominate Kremlin politics. It grew into a battle of such size that at a party conference 14 months later, Gorbachev was forced to break all tradition and open the Politburo's secret files on the Yeltsin case. Comrades, let me speak in purely human terms here. I take what happens at the Politburo to heart. What happens at the Politburo affects me, the General Secretary, most of all. So I'll tell you the real story. We needed an energetic and experienced man, a problem solver. And we saw those qualities in Comrade Yeltsin. The story Gorbachev was telling began before he came to power, when Boris Yeltsin was still a provincial party boss. Ironically, it was Yegor Ligachev who first spotted Yeltsin's talents. During Ligachev's trip to Yeltsin's province, he visited people in the factories, shops, and markets. People would stop him and say, our first secretary, Boris Yeltsin, is a good leader. Don't even think of taking him away from us to Moscow. That impressed Ligachev. Maybe that's why they transferred him to Moscow. That is why Yeltsin was proposed as Moscow party leader. And your humble servant put his signature on this. At first, Boris Yeltsin threw himself into his work. He identified problems, and he dealt with them. He did a lot of things to turn around Moscow. 
And we supported him. We knew that the Moscow party faced a very difficult task. Stagnation. There was total stagnation of public life everywhere in Moscow. The city's economy was in a disastrous state. Yeltsin's new position brought him to the top of the Communist Party Central Committee, straight on to the Politburo. But Yeltsin unceremoniously dropped the hand that had helped him up. Yeltsin, from the very start, reacted very negatively to Ligachev's style and to Ligachev's way of working with the Central Committee. Even at the 1986 Party Congress, Yeltsin was quite critical, both of the Secretariat and specifically of Ligachev, who ran it. The Central Committee takes care of everything, from trains to food to fuel. These are important, but more important is the question of staffing. Here their performance is lax. It seems the time is right to restructure the apparatus of the Central Committee. From the center of the Kremlin labyrinth, Ligachev ran the party bureaucracy, and this bureaucracy ran the Soviet Union. It was the source of his enormous power. They say that I am omnipotent. It's not true. I'm just one member of the Politburo, and I accept the discipline and abide by the rules of the Politburo. Yeltsin complained on many occasions about Ligachev. He said Ligachev was petty, concentrating on minor issues, that he was unprincipled and inconsistent and that he leaned on local party committees. We faced each other in the Politburo and we just locked horns. It was an open war. Yeltsin is all talk. And when push comes to shove, he's never actually achieved anything. So let's judge by the record and then decide. We had very violent arguments over the question of privileges. He believed there was no such thing as a privilege. He'd say, that's just what my people deserve. So what? Ligachev's bureaucrats were a caste apart, separated from the rest of Soviet society by power and by privilege. In Moscow, Yeltsin took on the bureaucrats. He began a campaign against party perks and privileges. He was the first Kremlin politician to make sure he was seen as the man on the street. Forgoing his own privileges, he went shopping with the masses, and occasionally he left his limousine at home, although he didn't forget the camera crew. I always want to see things change, moving toward the direction of greater social justice and equality. With these simple steps, Yeltsin turned perestroika into populism. Never before had a Soviet leader dared take the people's side against the party establishment. And the party establishment didn't like having their toes stepped on. Well, you know, a public bus. You know, people take the bus every day, even party officials. When I take the bus, for example, it's not considered a national feat. Yeltsin and I live in the same building. Sometimes when I'm waiting for the bus, he'll drive by in his big car to fight against <laughs> my privileges. They didn't understand. They said, 
Why are you doing this? They seemed surprised. I said, if I'm going to a factory, I want to travel like the workers. What's so special about that? If I want to give my driver a day off and have no car, I take the bus. Well, so what? Yeltsin's campaign was more than just photo opportunities. Behind the scenes, he was taking the Moscow party apart. He suddenly began a wave of sackings, many unnecessary. He would shout at us viciously, even over the most trivial things. It became oppressive. It was a terrible place to work. At first, it was difficult. I didn't know my staff. I had just come to Moscow and had to pick new people. Yeltsin sacked the old mayor of Moscow. He cast aside all six of the city secretaries, 15 of 19 section heads, and 22 of 33 district first secretaries. At first, we accepted that these people had to go. But then, he started a second, then a third round of sackings. Well, it began to worry us. And I personally criticized Yeltsin at the Politburo. Yeltsin was heavily criticized by General Secretary Gorbachev. He said, Boris, we are for perestroika, but perestroika means restructuring, not mindless upheaval. I can't say I never made mistakes. Of course, I made some mistakes, but not many. As usual, when Gorbachev took his summer vacation, the deputy leader, Yegor Ligachev, was left in charge. Throughout that summer of 1987, the Politburo continued to criticize Yeltsin and the way he was running Moscow. The capital city had always been a showcase for the party with public displays limited to the proud and patriotic. But under Yeltsin, things began to change. All kinds of characters began to use Moscow's new pedestrian precinct, the Arbat, as a hangout. To Yeltsin's conservative colleagues, it all smacked of bourgeois decadence. Yegor Ligachev toured the area and reported to the Politburo on his findings. There was a flood of complaints from the residents there about the noise and disorder, so the Politburo instructed Yeltsin to fix the problems. We considered allowing demonstrations in Moscow. And Yeltsin, who was then the first secretary, was in favor of allowing demonstrations and suggested something along the lines of a speaker's corner, like the one in London's Hyde Park. Yeltsin allowed nationalists to demonstrate on the streets of Moscow. These first protests were tame enough, but more followed. Yeltsin's popularity grew everywhere but on the Politburo. Well, Yeltsin had spoken to the diplomatic corps, and he even admitted to them that we had political prisoners in the Soviet Union. He even told them how many. And that caused a negative reaction in the Politburo. I decided that whatever my ideas were at that time, it was useless to try to get anyone there to pay attention to my views, my, my plans. Nobody took them into account. So I thought, why make it hard for myself and for them? 
In August 1987, when I was on vacation, I received a personal letter from Boris Yeltsin. He asked to be released from his duties as Moscow party leader. I didn't rush into anything. I kept the letter to myself. I didn't even tell the Politburo. Yeltsin's offer to resign was not the bombshell he had expected. Gorbachev was preoccupied with his next step for perestroika, a speech telling the truth about Stalin's crimes. And the conservatives in the Central Committee, who had blocked Gorbachev's election proposals in January, were again expected to put up a fight. So the last thing Gorbachev needed was controversy from Yeltsin. What he got would change both their lives. On October 21st, 1987, the Central Committee met in secret. No cameras, no reporters. This time, until the very end of the meeting, everything went as Gorbachev planned. The Central Committee listened. Gorbachev spoke. The deputy leader, Yegor Ligachev, presided. Ligachev asked, any comments or questions, statements? It was just a formality. Everyone was already getting up. It meant the meeting was over. It was a way of saying goodbye. I was standing on the left of the hall. Suddenly there was some commotion to my right. And then Gorbachev said, yes. That was the moment when Gorbachev interrupted Ligachev. He said, wait a minute, Boris Yeltsin wants to speak. Ligachev said, the session's over, I'm winding it up. No, said Gorbachev. Boris, did you ask to speak? Yeltsin said, yes, I did. Then Gorbachev said, then please let him speak. Yeltsin got up and tore apart the official line. Until then, no senior party member had dared question Gorbachev's policy of perestroika. Yeltsin did. He said that perestroika was not delivering the goods to the Soviet people, that life was not getting better, but worse. In effect, Yeltsin accused the emperor of perestroika of having no clothes. God knows why I did it. Maybe it's just the way I am. I didn't prepare a text. I simply had an outline, seven items on a piece of paper, just to be on the safe side. No. But I decided I had to seize the moment. I had to declare my position. And then Yeltsin started to attack Ligachev, his work and his intolerance. He accused Ligachev of holding compromising material on people. My fight was really with Ligachev. Gorbachev tried to act as a referee. He played the role of peacekeeper. Yeltsin never mentioned Gorbachev by name. He kept saying, and another thing, and another thing, and then finally he said, there's too much glorifying the general secretary at the Politburo. Then he left the platform. Everyone in the room knew that glorification of the leader was the hallmark of Stalinism. So Yeltsin was tarring his colleagues and Gorbachev with the brush of Stalin. And then it all got personal. And instead of discussing the report, everybody began discussing Yeltsin. It was indecent behavior for what we call a civilized country. Of course, everybody forgot about Gorbachev's speech. What? I'm going to quote from the minutes. After 27 people had spoken, this is how it ended. Gorbachev. How do you react to your comrades' charges? They have a right to know what you think. They'll be deciding your fate. Yeltsin says, apart from certain remarks, I agree. 
I let down the Central Committee and the Moscow Party. That was a mistake. Gorbachev, will you have the strength to carry on? This is word for word. Voices. He's not up to it. He must be removed now. Gorbachev, wait a minute, wait a minute. I'm asking you. Let's be Democrat. We need his answer before we make the decision. Yeltsin, I let down the Central Committee, the Politburo, and my own Moscow Party. All the Central Committee and the Politburo are against me. So I repeat. I ask to be released both from the Politburo and as leader of the Moscow Party. Perhaps I made some mistakes. I did say some things that weren't right at the meeting. But the problem wasn't what I said but when I said it. Resignation as Moscow party boss could be accepted only here by the Moscow party and the last act of the Yeltsin resignation drama would be something of a show trial. The strain of waiting took its toll. When the day came, Boris Yeltsin was in the hospital. The doctor said you're going to the party meeting. Yeltsin said I can't. I'm ill. The doctor said, orders are orders. What about the Hippocratic Oath? And Yeltsin said, I have my own Hippocratic Oath. There were rumors about a heart attack. His aides told me that he tried to stab himself with a paper knife. That's why he ended up in the hospital. It was clear he was lost, worried. For almost two years of living in Moscow, he'd been praised, admired. He was used to being honored and respected, and now he was to be condemned. Well, even a healthy man couldn't take that. The meeting was attended by Gorbachev himself. What followed was a ritual public humiliation. The members of the Moscow party, especially those Yeltsin had treated harshly, seize their chance to settle old scores. It was as if each speaker had taken a garbage can full of trash and just dumped it on Yeltsin. As far as my speech was concerned, I said that there are some people who rise on their own merits. Others do it by stepping on the people around them. I said that Yeltsin fell into the second category of people. It was a, a horrible scene. It went on for over four hours. I was sitting across from Gorbachev in the fourth row. I wanted to get closer, but I couldn't. I watched Gorbachev's face get redder and redder and redder. His eyes were darting all around the hall. Gorbachev was upset, visibly angry. His face was flushed. He shook his head. He didn't expect such sharp attacks against Yeltsin. Then the lynching was over. The last speeches had been made and the crowd was leaving. Many of them had that look of victory on their shining faces. Yeltsin was slumped over the table, his head in his hands. They were all walking out. Gorbachev looked back from the doorway and saw Yeltsin. Then he went back, took his arm, and helped Yeltsin out of the hall. Even though Gorbachev himself spoke quite harshly, when the time came to act, he simply shifted Yeltsin to an administrative post. In this way, he protected him. Yeltsin's career might have ended then and there. 
He could have been made an ambassador in some remote part of Africa. Many political careers used to end like that. Nevertheless, after 20 years of service to the party, Boris Yeltsin was out in the cold. No longer Moscow party boss. No longer on the Politburo. No longer on the way up. I've never felt so bad before. I've had my ups and downs in life. But nothing like this. This time I was really knocked down. The lower Yeltsin fell in the eyes of the party, the higher his reputation rose among the people as the rumors spread. Nobody knew exactly what he'd done, but they believed he stood up to the Communist Party and he was suffering for it. All over the world, people took notice. Among them was the BBC's Peter Snow, who interviewed the rejected Yeltsin. What about Mr. Gorbachev's role in your story? Do you, are you disappointed that he hasn't said more in your defense? I'm upset. He could have acted more decisively in renewing the leadership, the top rank. And that would have speeded up the process of perestroika. Would you like to see Mr. Ligachev removed from his position, removed from the center of power because he is, in your judgment, opposed to reform? Da. Once more, Yeltsin was making waves when Gorbachev needed calm. It had been a year and a half since Gorbachev first tried to bring democracy to the Communist Party, only to be blocked by the Central Committee. Now he was going over their heads. He called a full party conference, the first of its kind in half a century. Nobody knew what Gorbachev had up his sleeve. Everyone, who was anyone, showed up. On June 28, 1988, 5,000 delegates gathered in the Kremlin. Gorbachev opened the conference with an all-day speech. He abandoned his plans to make Communist Party officials face elections. Instead, he proposed to bypass them. If he could not make the party democratic, he would try to bring democracy to the Soviet parliament. This will be a new body of supreme political power with elected deputies. It will be called the USSR Congress of People's Deputies. What Gorbachev was proposing would mean the erosion of party rule. The issues were the same as in the January 1987 battle over party elections. This time, however, the debates played out before thousands in the hall and millions on television. The leading characters were the same. There could be two or three candidates. As long as the local party considered them acceptable as leaders. They would be voted on, not just selected, but elected. As democracy grows, so must communist discipline. When a decision is made, party members must follow it. We propose that the conference resolutions express this. Otherwise, our party will disintegrate into empty words. Gorbachev had called the party conference to advance democracy, and the delegates used the first public forum since perestroika was launched to ask some tough questions. Are you in favor of restricting the press so they never step out of line? Or do you want to put the press above the control of the politicians, even if it does cause trouble, as a free press can? Mikhail, listen. The people cannot be excluded from the political process. This is the main lesson of our past mistakes. What we are aiming for today is political democracy. The press has to bring the people into the political arena. One of Gorbachev's oldest friends from his hometown took him to task for being too soft on the bureaucrats. 
We know that you are a humane man and you want to change their ways. But the only solution is to quietly pension them off and get rid of them. Victor, let's have a chat in the presence of witnesses. Simply using the Central Committee to remove the bureaucrats doesn't work. If we sack one of your men, or even one of mine, it's no good. We've seen what happens before when we try to do too much from above. It simply doesn't work. The leadership gave the delegates free reign. But on the fourth and final day, one subject had still not been mentioned. Yeltsin was sitting in the balcony. I was in the center. He was to my left. Then suddenly, during the session, he appeared in the back of the hall. He walked down the aisle and sat in the front row. Every eye was on him now, and no one was listening to the speaker anymore. Suddenly, he made a dash for the platform. Sit down, Boris. Wait, wait a bit. We'll work something out. Boris Yeltsin has the floor. For the benefit of those who had missed it, an unrepentant Yeltsin re-ran the Newsnight interview. When I was asked if Perestroika would have moved faster without the presence of Comrade Ligachev, I said yes. Perestroika should have begun with the party. The party would have led society. But the party can't keep up with perestroika. After 20 minutes of hard-hitting diatribe, Yeltsin came to the question on everyone's mind. Comrade delegates, a delicate matter. It's a question of my own political rehabilitation. After the Central Committee meeting in October 1987, if you think time does not permit, so be it. That's all I can say. I think we should stop treating the Yeltsin affair as a secret. Let Boris Yeltsin say what he wants. Then we can all have our say. Please, Boris. I deeply resent what was done to me. I ask the conference to withdraw the resolution against me. I ask you to rehabilitate me before the party. Yes, the road to reform is a difficult one, but we've begun our journey, and destiny tells us we must continue on this road and no other. Yeltsin had thrown down the gauntlet to the conference and to Ligachev personally. It was fascinating to watch Ligachev. He had the leer of a hungry wolf ready for the kill. He stood at the podium to loud applause. Everyone knew that revenge was in the air. An anticipating smile played on his lips as he walked to the platform. He looked very confident, as if he were rolling up his sleeves, and everyone waited for him to tear Yeltsin apart. Hard to believe, but it's a fact. Yeltsin sat silent in the Politburo. Hours of crucial discussions went by, and he took no part at all. He just bided his time and let others tackle the problems. 
и принятие, принятие решений, по которым ждал весь народ. Молчал... Sounds outrageous, but it's a fact. Но это факт. Is that party comradeship, my friend Boris? I was expecting his speech. I know he would speak. Not everything he said was incorrect. But on the whole, it showed that you, Boris, are wrong. Ligachev won the fall. There would be no party rehabilitation for Boris Yeltsin. But too much dirty laundry had been washed in public. This was when Gorbachev stood and told the world his version of the Yeltsin story. I'll tell you the real story of when we recommended Boris Yeltsin as Moscow party leader. The chairman asks, do the comrades agree? When they all vote yes, that's not unity. That's a profanity. But the people don't understand that. Right. But it's not just the people. It's the Central Committee, too. They are so gripped by fear, they vote with one opinion here and another opinion there. The delegates knew their cue. When the democracy proposals came to the vote, a massive majority followed their general secretary and voted for an elected parliament. On the surface, it seemed these apparatchiks were voting to put their own jobs on the line. Everybody felt fine, thinking, ah, well, the task is so huge, it will take 10 years. So we'll be sitting pretty, at least, for another decade. But Gorbachev, in the closing seconds of the conference, pulled a rabbit out of his hat. I remember Gorbachev was standing, and he took a piece of paper from his pocket, a small piece of paper. It was the timetable for putting all the decisions at the conference into effect. The deadlines were minimal. Immediate adoption of the new laws on election. With elections to follow, just as soon, everything within a year. It took everyone by surprise. A French correspondent said to me, Do you understand what's just happened? Do you understand what's just happened here? I thought he was getting overexcited. Nothing had happened yet. He said to me, don't you understand? Your entire political system has just been turned upside down. It was only after voting that people stopped to think. They began to worry about what was in store for them. And as we left, I heard one of them say, Oh my God, what have we done? Nine months later, the Soviet Union was in the throes of its first ever democratic election campaign. Boris Yeltsin, the party's pariah, was the people's choice. They've brought up all the old accusations about me. It all stems from October 1987. It's the same old campaign. In the early years of the Second Russian Revolution, Gorbachev led the way. The people and the party, with more or less enthusiasm, followed. Then Gorbachev announced the first ever genuine parliamentary election in the Soviet Union to be held in the spring of 1989. A new concept, a new body, and a new name. The Congress of People's Deputies. It was a real revolution, the beginnings of perestroika. Everything before that was really just superficial. Never before had going to the polls meant anything in the Soviet Union. 
The very idea of more than one candidate was a novelty. An epidemic of election fever gripped the people. Anyone who could muster 500 signatures of support could be nominated. But before their names appeared on the ballot, they had to be approved at meetings controlled by the party. The party planned that Gorbachev's new Congress of People's Deputies would be dominated by the party. But many people, especially in the big cities, thought otherwise. Boris Yeltsin was not a man to turn a deaf ear. He was still in the party, though he had been disgraced and stripped of his top party posts. He was once again challenging the party's might. Of course, I didn't expect it to be all smiling faces. But to go about it like that, to use pressure in that way, organized by the whole propaganda machine, the entire propaganda machine was used to back my opponent. And I was left with only my volunteer army. But among Moscow's middle-aged matrons, volunteers were not hard to find. They were with Yeltsin as vehemently as the party machine was against him. Well, my political enemies tried to get all kinds of, of information on me. There were all sorts of innuendos, slander. They even published this booklet on how to criticize me during election meetings. The city party committee handed out these booklets to everyone. One third of the seats in the new parliament were reserved for official bodies, such as the Academy of Sciences. Thousands of scientists had nominated the eminent physicist and one-time exile, Andrei Sakharov. But his dissident past was too much for the Academy's governing board. They rejected him. There were rallies right here, in the little courtyard, outside these windows in the courtyards of the Academy. They had to find a way to get Sakharov on the ballot. Sakharov was at this rally. The photo of him standing in the crowd in the courtyard here appeared in newspapers all over the world. If the Academy wouldn't have Sakharov, many ordinary constituencies would. I went to the election meeting where Sakharov was being nominated. I came out of the subway and I saw a long line of people. I couldn't understand it. Well, we Soviets always want to know what people are standing in line for. I thought the line was for a furniture shop nearby. There were several thousand people. Of course, I was wrong. They said, we've come to support Sakharov. But Sakharov insisted on standing for his Academy of Sciences or for no one at all. Protest from its members forced the Academy to back down and nominate Sakharov as a candidate. He was duly elected. Churches and cinemas, sports grounds and underground stations became venues for the radical candidates standing against the official party nominees. The choice before the voters was not between two parties, but between orthodox communists and reformers. 
Uh, they mobilized all their forces throughout the city uh, for our district, and we did the same. All our subway stations in our district were filled by people. It was direct confrontation, pickets against pickets, uh, slogans against slogans. It was war of leaflets, mm, even sometimes direct clashes between two parties. People were sent to cover my rallies, so they really knew my speeches. Every time I left those rallies, policemen would come up to me and whisper, don't worry, we're with you. They were the first to congratulate me when I won the election. They knew the results at 2 a.m. at the party headquarters, but they were too embarrassed to announce it. A smiling policeman ran across the street and he said, you won, you won, you got 75% of the vote. He told me this before the election results were public. Then he said, can I have your autograph? In one church, after communion, the communion bread was wrapped in paper. On it was written, vote for Kazanik. <laughs> so that was a real act of courage for the clergyman. The clergy had never been involved in any kind of political propaganda and had never before openly campaigned for any candidate. Boris Yeltsin won with 89% of votes cast in Moscow. Though radicals won fewer than 20% of the seats all over the Soviet Union, they humiliated the party. In Leningrad, all the official candidates were defeated. As the party licked its wounds at its headquarters in Moscow, in the far south of the Soviet Union, real blood was to be shed. The question of who was responsible was to be the first test of the new Congress of People's Deputies. Since the election, nationalist demonstrators had taken over the city center of Tbilisi, capital of the Republic of Georgia. In early April 1989, local party bosses asked Moscow to send troops to control the situation. At the time, Gorbachev was out of the country. While Gorbachev and his more liberal colleagues discussed arms cuts with Mrs. Thatcher, the Georgian authorities' request for troops came to the most senior Politburo members still in Moscow, Yegor Ligachev. We prepared recommendations for the Politburo. That's important to understand. That's how we did things. We would set up commissions, groups to discuss and examine an issue in depth, and then make recommendations to the Politburo. In this case, the proposal came after the act. Ligachev and some members of the Politburo decided to send the troops. The tanks rolled into Tbilisi on the night of April 7th, just as Gorbachev flew back to Moscow. Ligachev reported to Gorbachev immediately, literally at the airport. Then our colleagues returned from abroad, the Politburo, including Gorbachev, Yakovlev, Shevardnadze, and considered the recommendations. Gorbachev was more careful, paid more attention than the rest of us. He said to Shevardnadze, maybe you should fly there. We all thought it was a good idea, but then we called the Georgian leaders and they said there was no need. However, one day later, the troops went into action against a crowd, armed at most with sticks. Twenty men and women were beaten to death with entrenching spades. I first heard about this on television. And after I saw it, I called Gorbachev and told him it was a total surprise to me. And he said he was just as surprised. To Stalin, 20 civilians killed would have been nothing. 
but in Gorbachev's Soviet Union, it was a shock. It would not be forgotten by the radicals when Gorbachev's own creation, the first Congress of People's Deputies, assembled six weeks later. On May 25, 1989, the 2,250 deputies waited with their leaders for the auspicious opening ceremony. Suddenly, this gray-haired man with a beard went up to the podium and demanded a moment of silence for the victims of Tbilisi. Gorbachev and his colleagues did not know what to make of this turn of events. I ask you all to honor those who died at Tbilisi. Everyone stood up, even the conservatives, because they just thought this was part of the script. The days of the carefully scripted party event were over. The deputy who had hijacked the opening ceremony had not finished. I want to know who gave the order to use force against the peaceful demonstrators in Tbilisi on April 9th. Gorbachev was not amused, and the sort of things that happened when Ligachev was left in charge were raised by another deputy, historian Roy Medvedev. I've noticed that as soon as Gorbachev goes on vacation or goes abroad, the whole state policy shifts by 50, 60, or even 180 degrees. This has happened over the last three years. Somebody must have said, Gorbachev's asleep. Let's break up the demonstration now. That's obviously what happened in Tbilisi. But to this day, we don't know who in Moscow sanctioned the use of force. Ligachev, seated here with his Politburo colleagues, had never been challenged in this way, in public and on television. I would like to know who did it. Radicals demanded a commission of inquiry. Gorbachev allowed it, setting a startlingly democratic precedent. The Politburo was to answer to the Congress. Moreover, the radical deputy Anatoly Subject was chosen to head the commission. Tbilisi became a rallying cry across the nation, as it was here in Subject's home city of Leningrad. We're not talking about soldiers. We're talking about those who make decisions to use troops against peaceful demonstrators. Such accusations brought the spirit of the first Congress to the streets. Subchek's commission would nail many senior communists, including generals and Politburo members. I think that Ligachev should have been held responsible and should have resigned then. He chaired that meeting at the Central Committee when they decided to help Georgia by sending in the troops. So, he should have resigned then. Ligachev was not solely responsible for sending the troops to Tbilisi, nor for the deaths. But the question now was, had he obstructed the course of justice? At a subsequent party gathering, Subchek was still hounding his quarry. Of course, I'd be delighted to listen to Comrade Subchek. Perhaps he can clear up some issues. Esteemed Yegor Ligachev, I will try to delight you. Could you please tell us when you failed to tell the truth? Because at the time when you spoke at the Parliamentary Commission for the investigation of the Tbilisi events on April 9, 1989, you said that there hadn't been a session on sending troops. As did all the other Politburo members. So, when did you change your mind? Or was it 
at the February Central Committee meeting when you said the opposite. Anatoly Alexandrovich, I must answer you. I have something to say to you, Comrade Sobchak. I have a copy of your report in my briefcase. First, I have always said the same thing at both meetings. What did Sobchak write? Well, let's see. He wrote that as soon as Gorbachev went away, where was it? England? As soon as he went away, that I organized a conspiracy behind his back. Both sides wanted heads to roll. The principle that Soviet leaders could be held responsible, unimaginable to Lenin, Stalin, and Brezhnev, was the hallmark of the revolution from below. And in this revolution, the radical's strongest weapon was television. They had persuaded the leadership to broadcast the Congress live every day. Thanks to television, Congress came into the homes of millions. The Congress itself became a drama. A sort of unscripted and improvised Shakespeare play. Nobody knew what was going to happen in the next five minutes. Which actor would speak or would get stabbed. With the Soviet people transfixed in front of their televisions, industrial output plummeted the country came to a standstill. At the end of the first day of the Congress, a crowd gathered in Pushkin Square, within shouting distance of the Kremlin. Here, all demonstrations had been banned. The police prepare for any mass event, whether it's Congress of People's Deputies or a football match. They specifically prepare for these because they know there could be disturbances. I went to this uh, square, it was Pushkinskaya Square, one of the main uh, uh, places uh, connected with our democratic revolution. And uh, there was uh, about uh, 2,000 people uh, there, uh, surrounded by police. This played into the radicals' hands, a molehill to make into a mountain at the Congress. Tbilisi will remain forever in our memories. When Zaslavskaya rose and spoke about it, about the demonstration in Pushkin Square, the chairman said, all right, we'll ask the minister. Is the minister here? Like a fool, I said I was. Is Minister Bakatin here? Yes. Can you give us a report? Calling a minister to answer in this way was another first at this Congress of Innovations. The police did not intervene. No action was taken, and no one was arrested after the meeting. One of the deputies, I think it was Stankovich, was there, and I think he spoke. Yes, and Comrade Sakharov was there. Once again, the impromptu was to prevail. At this Congress, Andrei Sakharov seemed to speak almost as often as Gorbachev. But at this early stage, neither of them were too certain what would happen. Andrei Sakharov, go ahead. Girls and boys are getting a poor lesson in Soviet democracy. We can't permit that. I support Deputy Zaslavsky's proposal that for the period of Congress, we should suspend the anti-democratic laws against public meetings and demonstrations. These are the facts. Moreover, moreover, I...
Moreover, I was asked to give some information, and... Fine. If we don't get on with this meeting, we'll be here forever. I ask that some respect be given to a deputy. The practice of blocking speeches is anti-democratic, intolerable at this Congress. Okay, Comrade Stankovic. Do you hear what I'm saying? I'm asking to stop this anti-democratic practice, which is the style of this Congress, unfortunately. Stankovic spoke with the authority of the 380,000 Muscovites who had voted for him. And millions more were watching on television. Although the radicals were only a minority, Gorbachev had his work cut out to stay in control. Before, in the past, all the general secretary had to do was raise an eyebrow, and everyone would know what to do. Jump to their feet, applaud, boo. The delegates would do his bidding. But this time, Gorbachev really had to steer the events. Sometimes he would shift to the right, sometimes the left. He was like a coachman with a runaway cart. It could have easily crashed. He had to try to steer it in the right direction. Those people told us, specifically me, since I took turns chairing the Congress with Gorbachev. They asked me, how can you allow this chaos to take place? Can't you control the Congress? Gorbachev had promised a democratic parliament and got all the trappings too. The radicals won a significant victory, the right to hold public meetings. Every day after the Congress, huge rallies met in the parking lot of Moscow's Olympic Stadium. I'm quite optimistic because people, you can see them here. People, uh, it is another kind of people than, pre than we have previously. They have a real uh, decision uh, to change this society. And uh, they never will be silent again. It was spring of our democracy, uh, honeymoon. Uh, no generation living now in Moscow ever uh, have ever seen such big rallies, such uh, sea of emotions. When I said the time of uh, repression, that the time of uh, dictatorship has gone forever, and people shouted, people supported, it was a great moment. In the heady atmosphere of Moscow, it was hard for the radicals to remember that they represented only a minority. In uh, one of my conversations with Gorbachev, he said uh, somewhat irritably, you radicals, you don't understand. You find it easy to talk, but you're talking from the point of view of Leningrad or Moscow. But what you don't understand is, the country is not just made up of Moscow and Leningrad. People throughout the country think differently. If everybody thought the same way as they do in Moscow and Leningrad, then I could act differently. But Russia is vast. People think in different ways. And that's not taking into account the other republics. And you know, I thought he was right. Gorbachev's new Congress worked as a forum for airing grievances. But it was an unwieldy body for day-to-day -day government. So one of its tasks was to choose, from among its own members, a smaller parliament, the Supreme Soviet, that would meet regularly. <laughs> Boris Yeltsin's popularity with his Moscow electorate would count for little when the Congress came to choose the Supreme Soviet. We need to elect a progressive Supreme Soviet. I don't want to offend anyone, but if they elect a bunch of yes-men, well then... The conservative majority followed form. They voted for the yes-men and rejected Yeltsin. But a little-known deputy from Siberia came to the rescue of his fallen hero. 
Fifteen minutes before the session started, I said to Yeltsin, I want you to take my seat in the Supreme Soviet. He was very surprised. He said, don't do it. A seat there is really worth having. I started half-heartedly to dissuade him. But he said, no. The voters wouldn't forgive him unless he did this. So then, Gorbachev and Lukyanov, two lawyers, debated whether this was legal. There was a vote and it was passed. I'm Kazani. He's Yeltsin. Different ranks. Different categories. I believe he should sit on the Supreme Soviet, not me. I can wait my turn. Kazanik's sacrifice put one famous radical into the Supreme Soviet, but it would still be overwhelmingly conservative, like the Congress that had elected it. Yuri Afanasyev was another of the Moscow radicals. He was to stun the Congress with the charge that for all the democratic rhetoric, nothing had really changed. I address myself to you, to whom I would call the aggressive, obedient majority. You have elected a Stalin-Brezhnev-type Supreme Soviet. I'm about to finish. I'm about to finish. Afanasyev's speech was simply anti-communist. There is no other word that I can use. And naturally, it had an, an extremely negative effect on everyone, not just me. Afanasyev's reception reflected the charge he had made. His radical colleagues did their best for him, while there was conspicuous silence from the aggressive, obedient majority. Many of these came from the far corners of the Soviet Union, from the Baltic to the Pacific, from the Arctic to the Middle East. For many, Russian was not even their first language. They sat in groups, each behind its local party boss. It was like watching a film of seals on the beach. The behavior of the regional deputies was similar to that. They all come from one place. They do what they're told. 30 or 40 men and women with one leader who is the biggest, most frightening seal. He keeps order. And he only needs to bark to make everyone obey him. In Gorbachev's new political circus, the seals barked loudest at Andrei Sakharov especially when the issue was the war in Afghanistan. I don't want to apologize to the Soviet army. I haven't offended the Soviet army or Soviet soldiers. After all, he said that, well, uh, I'm too old to learn this art of politics. Uh, I'm not politician. But uh, I can also do something. I will speak very honest about everything what we have now in our country. And uh, uh, this will be my contribution. I spoke out against the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan. That's why I was exiled to Gorky. I'm proud of what I did. Sakharov's comments were taken as insults by the many deputies who had served or lost family in this war. 
We are incensed at this irresponsible and provocative attack by the eminent scientist and regard his accusation as a damaging attack on the Soviet armed forces. I am against empty slogans, but there are three words I consider worth fighting for. Our state, motherland, and communism. It was very hard to just sit there when the entire hall stood up to clap and showed their hatred for Sakharov. I forced myself physically to, to stay in my seat. In this instance, Sakharov's behavior really provoked the Congress. Yes, they had organized a response in advance, but Sakharov's attack had provoked the Congress even farther. He asked for it, but the outburst was disgraceful. It reminded me of newsreels of the 30s when our workers demanded the annihilation of criminals, Trotskyites, and so on. What I saw was collective psychosis, a return to the days of Stalin. I have a small plot of land where I grow these beautiful flowers, peonies. And the morning after Sakharov's speech, I cut a huge bunch of these peonies, just huge was heavy with big blooms. I brought this monster bouquet to the Kremlin for Sakharov. He said, are these for me? Why so many? Where will I put them? It's true. You really needed to be strong to lift them. The gift wasn't so much for him as for me. I had to seek his forgiveness. I said, it's terrible what they did to you. Here, take my flowers as a sign of apology. At the Congress, the impact of the radicals had been out of all proportion to their numbers. The weekly journal Argumenti e Facti which sells over 30 million, ran a poll to determine the best deputy. Top choice was Sakharov. Yeltsin was second. And Gorbachev, who had given them their chance, came only 17th. But despite all this, Gorbachev was extremely pleased. He said, at last, we have a normal political structure where people can argue and work together instead of throwing knives at each other. I guess you could call that a moment of political triumph for him. The most important thing was not the decisions made at the Congress, but the fact that it actually happened that mattered. Its process. It was what happened during the session. Everyone in the entire country saw who their rulers were, how it was done, and what sort of people do it. Political awareness grew more in those three weeks than it had in 50 years. People got an inside look at the whole complicated machinery, and that determined many of the events that followed. The Congress unleashed a new rebelliousness. Within weeks, Soviet miners joined the revolution from below. I would talk to the miners about Congress. It was sort of a political lecture. Not all miners were fond of reading, and there was a lot of literature available. So I would take that material and I would read between the lines for them. The miners had real grievances. One man a day died in the Soviet pits. 
For years, the miners wanted to improve safety standards, and they wanted more money. So what was it in 1989 that brought the Siberian miners out on strike? Embarrassingly enough, it was the lack of soap. Our people are used to shortages, but for miners, soap was essential. That's just hearsay. Yes, soap was one of their demands, but the miners faced much bigger problems. Saluted by Lenin, the workers rose against the workers' state. Town by town, region by region, miners joined the Siberian vanguard. We decided to go to Victory Square at two in the afternoon. The square in Prokopiesk. We came in our work clothes to show off our pride and our strength. Picture the square in the summer. It was July, very hot, about, about 86 degrees. The heat was very strong. The miners were in their overalls, all sweaty, dirty, in their helmets and rubber boots. 20,000 miners standing there, their eyes flaming. The country's miners had the power to hold the state ransom, and the leaders in the Kremlin knew it. Once the miners go out, then all the other industries and workers would follow them. The country would then face a totally unpredictable situation. When Margaret Thatcher visited the Soviet Union and the strike came up in talks, she said, So what? My miners went on strike for a year and nothing terrible happened. In the end, they had to give in. But you see, she had several decades of experience behind her. For us, strikes were a new phenomenon. And of course, I as the minister, along with the rest of the government, watched the situation very carefully. Coal Minister Shadov set off for Siberia to tackle the striking miners. In the square at Prokopievsk, the miners waiting to meet him were apprehensive. It was our first strike and everyone was afraid. We were aware of the dangers. This was just after the troops had been used in Armenia and also in Georgia, where people had been killed. Of course. Everybody was afraid. Although we tried to hide it, it was difficult. We were afraid troops might be used to put down the strike. We even joked, well, at least we're in Siberia. We won't have to travel far to end up at the camps. My guiding principle was to keep the talks going, to always have open discussions, no matter how difficult. We could argue, swear, but at all costs, avoid force. And Gorbachev supported me completely. I think that was the one basic difference between Gorbachev and his predecessors. Because I'm convinced that neither Brezhnev nor Khrushchev would have hesitated for a minute to use force to restore order. But force never even occurred to Gorbachev. The only man who went everywhere, meeting the strikers in all those squares, was me, the minister. The miners had known me for years, and I knew all their problems. And since I had the power to make decisions, we could tackle their problems.
The strike was short, sharp, and widespread. Half a million miners came out. Shadov's reports to the Kremlin were not optimistic. Gorbachev was aware of our conversations, and we decided, after some consultation, that the state had to carry the costs. The miners demanded to be paid, and we had to pay them. If we follow the road of destabilizing the economy, it will paralyze perestroika. The Central Committee and the party and the government will have to look to other solutions to these problems. When Gorbachev spoke, we all watched the speech, he said the worst is over now. That's the moment when we knew there would be no violence. We could finally end the strike. We were all exhausted. I saw Gorbachev on television, and Nikolai Rushkov, too. They made a joint appeal and then sent a telegram saying they would meet the miners' demands. I signed, and then they asked me, where is Gorbachev's signature? I said, look, Gorbachev, and I have agreed on this. But I sent Gorbachev the paper anyway. He signed, agreed, and then we gave this paper to the miners. In Soviet history, from Lenin on, the leaders had never given in to the people. Now Gorbachev's perestroika had been outrun by the revolution from below. The miners had overpowered the general secretary and the prime minister. Had Gorbachev and Rishkov signed away their own future?